here we are now. With, well, what are we with? I guess we are with some words to share, some words to say, some ideas to think about, some stories to tell. And today, the words I'd like to share, the story I'd like to tell, is of my favourite S.N. Goenka parable or joke or story. Call it what you may. It's probably my favourite. It's the one that makes me laugh the most. And I need to hear this as much as anyone. I'm really saying this to myself because it's something I need to remind myself of because of what's happening here now today with what is going on. What's going on right now? What are we here with? Well, I guess we're here with anything that you're experiencing. I'm here with anything that I'm experiencing, and of course I can only speak for myself. The conditions are not exactly ideal, but of course are ever things ideal. Are they ever ideal? Because the ideal is quite lofty, isn't it? When you think about it. It's quite unrealistic. When you consider what your ideal situation would be, things can get become, can get, can become quite extravagant. And there's some value going into that. There's some value to, <laughs> as we could say, <laughs> explore the muscle of the ideal in the psyche or the being or wherever it sits within whatever it is that's going on and whatever it is that you are, which are two things that actually have a very trepidatious relationship. <laughs> so this is why we can just say, well, we're here with some words to share and we can leave it at that. Here we are right now with whatever it is that we can surmise is here and we'll say to get things underway that it's good enough to explain that as some words to share. Well, I'm talking, you're listening. And that's all we really need to know. And as for this story, well, S.N. Goenka, I've spoken about him in the past. He is a teacher, if you haven't heard, if you don't know, of Vipassana meditation techniques. And he runs meditation retreats all over the world in many countries and has been a teacher for decades. And he's no longer alive or he's no longer in the body, as some schools would say. But his teachings endure because, well, his teachings are used in many institutions around the world. So I'm a regular attendee of such institutions, of such meditation retreats. And I've spoken about that in detail, so you can always go back and listen to that conversation if you'd like to know more. But today I just want to talk about this one story, this one anecdote, and there's so much in it. And it's so important. And I really feel now, for me personally, this is something I need to come back to. And the story goes like this. And to really set it up, I should mention that one of the principles of Vipassana meditation is to witness or to watch yourself, to see what's going on, to really consciously know how you are moment by moment. So when you're on one of these meditation retreats and S.N. Goenka is doing his teachings, he's telling you to just observe, just observe, come back to the witness. And of course, there are many dynamics to that, which he explains. There are many techniques and ins and outs to the process. But one of the things is to, well, watch for when anger arises. And this is where we come into this story. This is where he tells this anecdote, and I love this so much. This is so amazing. 
He says, You can sit and you can watch yourself. But there's always a chance that you'll forget. You'll lose your consciousness, right? You'll have a lapse in awareness. And then maybe something like anger will come up without you knowing. So what can we do? Well, how about we hire someone to stand right next to you? And their sole job will be to watch for when you become angry. And whenever they see you're becoming angry, we'll just say, hey, look, master, anger is arising. Remain aware, remain conscious, remain alert. Now, of course, this is a bit ridiculous because you can't have someone stand over your shoulder 24-7. So, as the story goes, well, we'll have eight-hour shifts and we'll have three people every 24 hours. That way you've got someone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can say, well, actually in this country we've got labour laws and people need weekends, people need sick leave, people need holidays, they need annual leave. They need maternity leave. They need long service leave. These are the labor laws. Now, every country has a certain dynamic of that, some more than others, and some are better off than others, and they're all different in different cultures. But more or less, basically, the story goes that we need someone else. So we've got a whole team of people, and we've sorted it all out so that we've got someone watching me 24-7 to make sure that when anger arises, they can remind me, look, remain aware, remain conscious, stay in your witness, anger is arising. Now, what happens? One day, I'm going about my work, and some anger arises, and my little servant bends down and whispers in my ear and says, Master, look, anger is arising. And what do I do? The first thing I do, I hit him over the head and say, what are you doing? Get away from me. <laughs> and that really is the punchline. That really is the, the, the joy and the, the absurdity of the, <laughs> the story. And of course, when Esen Goenka tells this, I just burst out in laughter. I just think it's so great that your reaction is to hit the person telling you that you're angry. <laughs> but of course, this is exactly the problem. This is exactly the thing that needs to be understood. And this is a very powerful insight. This is so deep. This is so important. The, the message that is being communicated through this parable needs to be understood. And in its most simple form, the message is that you can only watch yourself. It's only you that is responsible for your own witnessing. Only you can be the one who is able to hold yourself aware to remain conscious, to remain alert, to remain in that better space, in that better part of you. And of course, this comes up in many ways because we could say that it's not just anger that your servant needs to be watching or more realistically, you need to be watching. It's also all the other values we could have a whole team of servants, one for anger and then one for, well, when you're talking to someone in an inappropriate way or when you're talking to someone in a way that isn't aligned with your higher values. Or we could have someone for your addictive behaviors. Master, look, you're doing a behavior which is driven by your addictions. You're about to consume something because of your addictive habit. Or we could have one for your laziness. Master, you were being lazy. Remember you said you didn't want to be lazy. 
Or we could have one for your neurotic thinking. Master, look, you're thinking the same thing over and over, and this is just neurotic. Remember you said you didn't want to be thinking certain things that go around and around and around. Now, of course, the thinking one is a bit tricky because how is the servant going to know what you're thinking? They're not going to be able to get inside your being. It's much more difficult than something, say, like when you're talking to someone, you're having a relation with someone, or when you're doing a behavior that can be observed. And you see how, well, the whole thing just collapses. There's no way you could have a team of people doing that. And really, when you get a sense of what it's like to step into your higher self, you realize that there are more and more things that you need to step up to. There are more and more things you need to hold yourself accountable to. And of course, even that in itself can become its own vice. You can beat yourself up for not living up to your higher self, and that in itself is the problem. If only you could just relax and not be so hard on yourself. Maybe it would be that you wouldn't actually have such a struggle to live up to those things. Now, there's another story that comes to mind, and I'm sure you've heard this one. This one is very famous. And this is the story of Marcus Aurelius. And he had something similar. I suspect the same sort of idea occurred to Marcus Aurelius. Because he did almost exactly what Esen Goenka was talking about in this parable. Which is that he hired someone to come up to him and whisper in his ear, every now and then at random points throughout the day, you're only a man and you will soon be dead. Now Marcus Aurelius lived in a very different time in history to us in a very different culture. It's very hard to even get a sense of what it was like for him to be who he was, where he was with the people around him, and the situation that he was in in his life. He was a man of power. He was a man of immense will, a man of immense responsibility, a man of re a man of immense well. Well, he was really a man of immensity, we could say. It's by no means the peasant life that he had. And he had power, which is quite hard for our modern mind to appreciate. Because he had the power to have people killed. And not just killed, but killed publicly. If he wanted, he could have had people executed in the public sphere, in the public square. And not only that, he could wage wars. He had armies on his side. He had wealth on his side. He had the popular vote on his side. Now, of course, there are other sides to this, which is that he was responsible for the plagues and the wars that were waged against his kingdom when he was in power, and the problems of infrastructure and economy and natural resources and the whole pantheon of what it means for a civilization to organize itself into a collective. So it was by no means easy times, it was by no means that he was some sort of overlord who lived in a complete protection of his power, as if he was untouchable. Not at all. And yet also, if you read the writings, 
if you read his journal or his letters or whatever form it was, and of course this is so famous now, this is such a widely read book, you've probably read it, you've probably heard of it, which is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. If you read that, really, you can get a sense of what it was like to be inside his being. You get a taste of his values. You get a taste of his resolve. You get a taste of the certain depths that he understood for himself in relation to what it means to be alive, in relation to what it means to live as a human being in this big blue ball. And when I read that, I get a sense that this was a great man. This was someone who thought very deeply about things. This is someone who wanted to do the right thing. Someone who had a profound moral compass. Now, you can disagree with how that moral compass guided him and what his actual values were, but you can't disagree that morality was something fundamental to him, something that he was aware of. I get the sense that he was a man who really did want to step up to his higher self and understood that as ever much greatness he had in his influence in the sphere of politics and power, it was not enough for his being to step up. It was not enough for him to be in power, or if we can, let, let me try and say this again in another way. It wasn't, it, it's not good enough for him to be able to be all powerful. What he really needed was to step up inside his being inside his core, inside his values. And that's why he's hired this man to whisper in his ear. You are only a man and you'll soon be dead. And of course, I feel this myself. I feel there is so much that I need to step up to. There is so much that I fail on. There is still laziness. There's still relapses of addictions. There are still hang-ups. And of course, I think again about Marcus Aurelius, and we could say that, well, we can only surmise so much from his writings. It might have been that it was the better part of him that was writing when he wrote those words. And yet he still had a lower part of him that, well, might actually have lived out quite a bit in his life. It might have been that he didn't live up to his values quite as much as we may imagine. But the good was in him, the power of his own inner world and his own resolve was in him. At least that much is certain. And my own experience is that it takes time. You have to do what you can, and things do improve. It's almost like two steps forward, one step back. Three steps forward, two steps back. A few days where there's a whole bunch of steps forward, and then a few days where there's a whole bunch of steps backwards. And really the emerging value that comes from that is consistency. The emerging value is the ability to have the same thing happening over and over each day. And one of the ways you can do that is through behavior. Doing the same thing each day. Consistently. And of course it takes an awareness for that to have an effect which is forward moving or upwards moving. 
It's not enough to do the same thing every day and have it be as just any old thing. It has to be something which is a practice that is designed and poised directly towards building an awareness of what you are. So in a nutshell, you have to meditate every day. You have to do your spiritual transformative practice every day. And there are many forms of those. There are many ways in which that can take form. And if you're really holding yourself to it, if you're really dedicated to it, you can start to see that you're on your own. You don't have someone standing over your shoulder to remind you every time you have a relapse, every time you waver off course. And that's part of the trip. That's part of the development of the skills that you have that are required for... It's, it's really like... It's, it's like you're developing skills in order to be able to just do the things that will lead to skills. There are certain things you need to have under your belt just to be able to begin to do the practices that will lead to certain skills. And it's quite ironic, really, because awareness has this funny thing about it, which is that it snowballs. And of course, you could say the same about addiction, more unawareness or unconsciousness. So you need to have a little bit for it to lead to a little bit more. And once you've lost some, well, you lose even more. And that's my experience. That is what it means, or what it, what it has meant for me. And of course, there's also this thing, which is that it's quite hard to actually assess for yourself. It's quite hard for you to know exactly how much progress you've made. And if you were to compare yourself to some years ago, well, that comparison would have to take some detail to it for it to really make a strong impact on you. And this is why a deep introspection of the past is so important. Reliving of the past, not just in your thoughts and your memories, but also on a sensational level, on an emotional level, on a perceptual level. Because it could be that you've got someone standing over your shoulder. Now imagine this guy standing over your shoulder whose job it is to say whenever you get angry, remind you to remain alert and conscious whenever you become angry. Now he's going to be having this job where you say, well, what does it actually look like for my master to be angry? Now, I've seen him angry once before, but is that the benchmark? What if he's only just a little bit angry? What if his way of angry becomes passive? What if his ang way of angry becomes like a kind of brooding? What if how he expresses himself changes? And what if it's only a small degree of anger? What if it's just a tiny little bit? How closely should I be watching him? Now, it might have been that, well, when I first got this job, he was having outbursts of anger all the time. And he'd really get rid in the face and huff and puff and yell and swear and break things. And I'd always have to quiver and cower and go up and say, Oh, Master, remember I told you that my job is to remind me, remind you. I say, oh, yes, yes, oh, yes, huh? Look and remain conscious. I'm very sorry that I have to interrupt your anger. And now since he's had this job, the servant might start to realize, well, he doesn't really do that anymore. Is it still his job to remind him? But after a couple of years, you could have an interview with that 
servant. And you could ask him, well, how has your master's anger changed over the years? What's it been like, really, to work in this job for these last few years? And he could talk. He could say, well, I had to be really on edge sometimes. There were some really difficult days. I really did get hit hard, and especially when things were first starting out. But also he's made great progress. He's also made certain subtle increments, certain details. The things that he does, the things that he says have changed. And you could ask this servant, well, what do you think has led to that? Do you think it's all been because of you? And the servant might say, well, maybe it's a bit of both. Maybe it's a bit of the job that I've got. And also that the master has learnt other things. And he's practiced certain things. He's realized unto himself the importance of realizing. He's realized the importance of realizing <laughs> that it's important to remain alert and conscious when anger arises. And so on and so forth. But you realize that this servant that is making these observations, that is you. You need to have that job. That's your job for yourself. And you can actually talk to that servant within you when they've had the job for a while. And it doesn't have to be so psychosomatic. It's not like that we've got these multiple personalities within us. I mean, you, <laughs> you could look at it like that. You could say, well, the side of me that's watching me is got this own sort of personality and this own dialogue and its own history, and I like to communicate with it as if it's a different person, but I really know that it's me, but <laughs> that's a little bit too much psychosomatic. We can just say directly, how has it been for you over the past few years to relate to your anger? How have you managed to become more alert and conscious of your anger? And it applies to the other things as well. We can say, how has your relationship to your addictions changed? How have your feelings around your addictions changed? How have your habits changed? How has your new neurotic thinking changed? How have your relationships changed? And when you go down this path, well, you see again, as we have done previously as we're illustrating things in this way, that, well, it's all up to you and it's never ending. And there's always another higher value that you can add and inquire into and uphold yourself to. And it's really quite tricky to find the juice. There's a kind of... I like to use the word propellant. There's a kind of propellant that happens when you come into contact with what it means to live like this. It's a kind of motivation, really. You're being propelled to be motivated to actually go into this space and to say, ah, I remember, I need the servant and I am the servant. And no matter what happens, whenever I become angry, I'm going to let that servant come up in me and say, look, master, don't act, just observe. Remain alert, remain conscious, remain aware of your anger. And don't hit yourself over the head. <laughs> Don't be the one to say, yes, I know I'm angry. Ah! Bugger it. <laughs> That's a lesson into itself. That's part of the trip. So those are some thoughts. That's my favorite SN Goenka parable or story. That's a little bit about Marcus Aurelius too, which I believe is a correlatory story. And of course I'm saying this as I mentioned at the start because this is where I'm at. For me, it's 
holding myself to the work that I need to do, holding myself to the higher values, holding myself to not giving in to those petty things. And it's an ongoing process, as it is for all of us. We're all at different stages. We all have different ways of being. Because, of course, another way of realizing where you're at is actually encountering how other people are. Now, this is not the same as comparing yourself to others. And really, this is a conversation that we need to have in and of itself. Maybe it's a conversation we need to have for another day. Because like, because like you can compare yourself to who you were previously, you can compare yourself to how others are. But that way of saying comparing yourself to others has too many negative connotations and there's quite a lot of different dynamics or mechanics to that which, if I don't explain it, can be taken the wrong way. So just flag that as a concept that we can talk about on another day. I mean, sensing the other is a very deep, very deep subject, and we will talk about it when the time is right. So those are some thoughts, and I'd just like to say also that sometimes it feels like an age has passed between these episodes. I mean, I know I'm still releasing one a day, one per day, but that's the release schedule. I mean, I'm still having other things go on. A lot of other things go on in the background. And I can't believe how different every day is. I can't believe how... I mean, my, my whole voice feels different. I mean, probably to you it doesn't feel or sound much different, but it does feel so much... so much changed in so many ways. But, you know, this is just stories, so let's not divulge into babbling. If you've been enjoying these episodes, please do share your favorite episode. That would help me greatly. That would help me find the people who are interested in the sort of things we're talking about. So please do. And leave me a comment as well, if you can, on wherever you're listening this, wherever you're listening to this, because as I can surmise, <laughs> There's about no one listening at this stage. So <laughs> if you are hearing this, please just leave me a comment so I can know that someone is listening. So thanks very much for tuning in. And that's all I have to say for now.